you, but I'm happy to be a Christian. I have found in the last couple of days, as I've been around people out in the world, they are lacking happiness. They're lacking fulfillment. They're lacking joy. They're lacking completeness in their life. They're lacking stability. They're lacking even the ability to see what's going to happen in the future and kind of know what's going to happen to their soul in the future. They're, they're, they're standing on the sand instead of standing on the rock. It brings me great happiness to know the Word of God and joy. And even as we see human history and what's happening right now in human history, it just seems like God is beginning to pour out more and more blessings on my life while the rest of the world is kind of falling apart. While the rest of the world is kind of nervous about what's going on, God has made it clear to me that we will be under full blessing as believers. And we will be under His watchful eye as things kind of fall apart. As believers in Christ who are interested in Bible doctrine, God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And as I study the Bible and we study about Christ and what Jesus is and who He is, I see the end of the story. I see Christ. And we see it, the end of the story here in Revelation chapter 19, and it's a glorious one. A lot of people watched football yesterday. I saw a lot of people say, oh, we, did, you know, we didn't really know how it was going to end, and now we kind of see, oh, it's kind of down, you know, and we got some real tough games coming up, and it doesn't look too good. But I'm going to tell you, God has showed us the end of this game called the Angelic Conflict. And guess who the winner is? It's Jesus Christ, and he's going to share the victory with us. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, it says, Now I saw heaven open. If you didn't know it, this is the second advent of Christ, and at this time the world is going to be shrouded in darkness. The Bible says, the unbelievers around Jerusalem can't see the hand in front of their face. They're going to be so confused, they're going to start shooting one another. It says chaos is going to reign. Darkness is going to fall across the land. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. And here's what the unbeliever is going to see. And it says that every eye on earth is going to see this. Everyone on the earth is going to see heaven open. The sky is going to roll back, as it were. And here's what they're going to see. And it says, I saw heaven open, and behold. I love this, because it didn't just go on to describe. It says, behold. You know what that means in Arkansas? By golly. By golly, you'll never, you'll never guess what I saw. By golly. Here is Jesus Christ. And behold, a white horse. The white horse is there. You know what the white horse stands for? Victory. The triumphal procession. Did you know the Roman generals, they rode horses into battle, but they picked out their favorite horse to ride into battle. And it wasn't always white. It might have been uh, red or sorrel. It might have been bay colored, black. It may have been all different colors. It could have been a Clydesdale. We don't know. But they had their favorite battle horse. He was steady in battle. He knew how to charge into the enemy. So the generals would lead from horseback. They chose their favorite horse. But guess what? If they won the battle, guess what? They traded out their favorite horse when they came back to town. Guess what they got? They got a big white stallion. A big white horse because... When he rode back in town in victory, the sign of victory was that the winning general was on a white horse, a white a war horse. And this horse would have been manicured, groomed. He would have been fed good. I mean, he would be feeling good. He would pick his feet up when he came into town. And behind the general, the army would come, and each soldier would have in front of him 
a, a opposing member that he had captured in battle. And so he would have a opposing enemy force, and he would have him handcuffed there, and they would march him into town. And the great white war horse, he would lead the way, and they would throw flowers at him. And it was just a huge celebration. It was a parade. And they would bring the spoils of war if they had any artifacts, if they had any money. They would march that. Everything they got from battle, they would bring, and the soldiers would have their uniforms on and any medals that they won there. And they would file right down through the streets in a parade. And all the citizens, you got to take off from work to live. They celebrated. It was called the Triumphal Entry. And they marched the uh, prisoners right downtown where they were uh, usually slain in front of the Mamertine Dungeon. And some of them would have been thrown into jail, but um, they were marched right downtown. This gives you the layout of what will happen at the Second Advent. Because Jesus Christ the victor of the angelic conflict is going to come back to earth in the second advent and guess what he's riding? The white victory horse. Just like the uh, Roman generals would have rode and says, now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat on him was called faithful and true. We know Jesus Christ is faithful and true, but did you know we are supposed to be like Christ. The goal of our Christian way of life is to be faithful and true like Jesus. We ought to be ones, when people see us, they ought to think about us being faithful and true. And Jesus Christ is faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. We've had a lot of questions in the past week. Should we go to war? I don't know that we should go to war. Well, guess what? Jesus Christ does not have to counsel with any members. He, he doesn't have to counsel with him because he has perfect righteousness and justice. And he's going to go to war with the unbelievers of earth. In verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire. I like this. When you look into the eyes of Jesus, you can see justice. Flame in the Bible represents the judgment and the justice of God. And you can see how Jesus is fair and just. And this is a lot of the uh, last image that the unbelievers will see of Christ. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Many crowns. I want to tell you this morning, I'm going to stop right here. I want to tell you what those crowns are on his head. Jesus Christ is three kinds of royalty. Yes, he is. You see this purple tie? I don't wear this purple tie because I'm trying to prove my manliness. I wear it because I'm a royal family member. See, purple represents royalty. Jesus is three kinds of royalty. His first type of royalty is divine royalty. In your notes, you want to write the first type of royalty is divine royalty. My children are homeschooled. The first class they take in the morning is Bible class. I'm teaching them how to listen to a tape and record notes. And they've been learning how to listen to the kernel. And uh, they're listening to the 69 basic Bible series and they're getting chewed out. And uh, in the morning, and they're getting straightened out. Now, you can't do that at public school, friend. Now, I'm teaching them how to take notes, and they're going to take notes this morning. The first type of royalty is divine royalty. Jesus is three kinds of royalty. The first type is divine. His title under the first type is the Son of God. The Son of God. The second member of the Godhead. How did he win his first title? By accepting God the Father's plan. You see, God the Father's plan said, one day you'll have to be born a man. 
and go to earth and live as man, as men live and be crucified and accept the judgment for the sins of the world. And he accepted God the Father's plan. His royal family as divine royalty is the Trinity. So he has a royal family. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit is his royal family in eternity past. And so that's Jesus' first crown he's wearing there as divine royalty. His second type of royalty is Jewish royalty. Jewish royalty. His title under Jewish royalty is the Son of David. How did he win his second title of Jewish royalty in the name of Son of David? He was successfully born into the hypostatic union. I don't know if you knew it or not, but Satan attempted to prevent the birth of Christ in many ways. And it was some doing to get Jesus here into the pure bloodline, into the Davidic dynasty. And so his family in the second type of royalty, Jewish royalty, are the Jewish age believers. So that's Jesus' second type of royalty. He's Jewish royalty. Jesus is the third type of royalty, though. He is battlefield royalty. That's the third type. Battlefield royalty. I like this one. Battlefield royalty. That means this king's going to fight. You hear me? He's got some fight in him. His title under battlefield royalty, is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus is battlefield royalty, and his title is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How did he win his third royal title? He went to the cross, and he died, bearing the sins of the world, and not only that, He broke the chains of death and rose from the grave, defeating Satan. And so at the cross, he won his third royal title by defeating Satan in his strategic victory. Now, here's the problem. Jesus did not have a royal family for his third royal title. So guess what happened? Bam, here you are church age believer and so the the family for his third royal title is church age believers and so right now god is forming jesus's royal family and every time someone believes in christ they're entered in union with christ and they become royal family And that's why I'm wearing a purple tie, because I am royal family. And my Savior is the King of kings and Lord of lords and the battlefield royalty. So we see here in the scripture, it says, On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Verse 14, this is where you come in, royal family. Verse 14 says, And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen. This is you. Believers are coming back with Christ. Those that don't believe in the rapture, of course, they say this is angels. They're wrong. This is all church age believers riding behind Christ, mounted up. And it says they're they're clothed in fine linen. Did you know how you got cleaned up here? It says you're clean here. You went through a fire. You went through judgment. God cleansed you from sin at the cross, but at Bema, He's going to cleanse you of your human good. 
God doesn't allow filthy rags in heaven. And in 1 Corinthians 3, it says that He's going to send our works through the fire and only divine good will come out on the other side. And so here we've been through Bema. We're cleansed. It says clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And we followed him on white horses. And so we see here Jesus Christ at his second advent is going to lead the way. He's the only one that gets bloody. He's going to do the fighting. And the Bible describes that Jesus is going to have a triumphal entry back into the world. It says that Satan is going to be chained. And did you know what your job is going to be? Jesus is going to assign to you one demon to catch on your on your horse. See, right now you can't ride that good. See, we're going to have to fly through the universe at a high rate of speed to catch these angels. I didn't know if you knew it or not. Angels can fly through the universe. And uh, right now you might fall off and you might get scuffed up. But in your resurrection body and on this valiant steed that you're going to be riding, you're going to be able to catch that demon who is loose in the universe. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to have that big round up in the sky. And we're going to round up those demons just like the Roman triumphal procession. We're going to bring those demons right up to the bottomless pit. And one at a time, they're going to get dumped over in there until there are no more demons loose in the universe to start the tri- the mid the millennium, and so it's going to be your job to help clean it up. We're going to learn that in Colossians two fifteen under the word three Ambros. And so what I wanted you to see here is is that we have an awesome Savior, and we know the end of the story. Now turn back to Colossians chapter one. This will give you a intro into what we we have been studying. Colossians chapter 1. We're in verse 18 and it says, And Jesus, he is the head of the body. The kephale, the head, the absolute authority of the body. That is us, church age believers. The church, ecclesia. We form the body of Christ. We're a spiritual entity. Who is the beginning? The arche. Jesus started it all. He started the church age with his resurrection. The firstborn from the dead. The, the firstborn is special privilege. I didn't know if you knew that or not. In the Old Testament, the firstborn was the ruler. He was also the priest. And the firstborn received a double portion. And this uh, Christ is the firstborn of the church from the dead. And so Jesus conquered physical death. So that in all things he may have the preeminence. And that mu- that means that Jesus is holding first place in all things. It says that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead, from the dead, out from the dead. And I want to stop and look at the word death this morning because this is a category that we're going to fly through. But I believe that we need to be uh, reminded of this category from time to time because it has to do with our spiritual life. Jesus is the firstborn out from the dead. When the Bible says death, there are eight different types in the Bible. And so we're going to build a category having eight points. And it's going to show the different uses of the word death. The first use of the word death is physical death. We all know what that means. One day we're going to die. 
if the rapture doesn't happen, we will face physical death. Physical death is the separation of the soul from the body for the unbeliever, and for the believer, it is the soul and the spirit from the body. So when you see death, you think about separation. I'm not going to expect you to take detailed notes on this because I'm going to be going a little bit fast. So use your shorthand or just write down the main points. For the believer, we know we are face-to-face with Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, Endomeo proscurios, and it means to be out of the body is to be at home, face-to-face with the Lord. For the unbeliever, it's a separation of his body and his soul. The Bible says the unbeliever goes directly to torments. There awaiting judgment at the great white throne will be cast into the lake of fire. And so this obvious principle here is believe in Christ before you die. Because after physical death, there is no more chance for you to believe in Christ You only suffer judgment. And so I heard about a great evangelist one time. He went to town. I think it was in Chicago. And the first night of the crusade, he went to the the Coliseum there, and he he said, I'm going to tell you a story. And he preached about Jesus, and he said, come back tomorrow night. I'm going to tell you the end of the story. And I'm going to invite you to believe in Christ. And that very night, was the night of the great Chicago fires. And many hundreds of people died that night that were at the Coliseum. He said, I regret so badly that I did not go ahead and give the invitation to believe in Christ that first night. And he said, never again will I put off an invitation. And so we won't even put it off to the end. If you've not believed in Christ, you need to believe in him now and accept him as your Savior because he died on the cross on your behalf. And so the unbeliever at death no longer gets to use his volition. It's locked in. He goes to torments and then awaits judgment at the great white throne. Under physical death, Jesus Christ's death was different than any other member of the human race because he dismissed his own spirit. He had a supernatural physical death where his spirit went to the Father and his soul went to paradise. Eight different kinds of death in the Bible. And one thing I want to add is that When you see two different Greek terms in the Bible, most of the time it relates to one form of death. The first term is necros. And normally it relates to the physical death of Christ. And then when you see the term thanatos, It relates to the spiritual death of Christ. And that's our next category, spiritual death. Spiritual death is category number two. When you see the death, when you see death in the Bible, it does not always mean physical death. There's eight different ways it's used. The first time we see, we see Genesis 2, 7, God says to Adam, if you eat the forbidden fruit, dying thou shalt die, is actually what it says in the Hebrew. And it points to the fact that Adam would die a spiritual death because we saw that he ate the fruit and he didn't die for another 900 years. So what happened? He died spiritually. In Genesis 3, 7, we see that his eyes were open and we read on and see the curses that spiritual death brought to the earth and to man. 
my father and I, we went over one of the curses we were working on Saturday, and one of the curses says, by the sweat of thy brow thou shalt eat of it. I had to remind myself of that every day when I'm slaving away. One of the curses of Adam's original sin is that man shall work to eat his bread. And of course, socialism and communism tries to go against the curse. By the sweat of thy brow thou shalt eat of it. And so Adam dies spiritually when he ate the forbidden fruit. Now here's the problem. Point B, mankind died with him. Adam stood as the head of the human race. And so it says, when Adam sinned, all sinned. And you say, well, I wish I'd have been there. You'd have done the same thing. You'd eventually fail. Don't worry. 1 Corinthians 15, 20-22 explains the spiritual death the human race was plunged into when Adam ate the, the forbidden fruit. Now Christ died a different kind of spiritual death upon the cross. Isaiah 53, 9 says, deaths in the plural. Jesus died twice on the cross. We understand that Jesus was crucified about 9 a.m. in the morning. But about 12 noon, darkness fell across the land. God the Father had convened the Supreme Court of Heaven on top of that hill of Golgotha. It was going to be so bad he had to cover the land in darkness so that no one could see what was about to happen on that cross. Jesus began to scream out over and over again, the Bible says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Have you ever thought of this? Jesus did not scream out when he got punched in the face. And the Bible says he got punched so many times in the face he could not recognize him. He never said a word. Jesus did not cry out while he was being whipped. He, he got whipped 39 lashes with a cat of nine tails. It removed the flesh from his back. You could have seen his rib bones. He didn't say a word. The Bible says he remained silent like a sheep. He didn't cry out one time. When they impaled on his head the crown of thorns, and if you've ever had a thorn in you, you know how bad it hurts. Those thorns have poison in them that hurt terribly. It's like getting a broken bone. They shoved that crown down on his head through his scalp. He didn't cry out. Not one time. He was ridiculed and tortured. And he remained silent. And even as they drove the nails through his hands, he didn't scream out. You know what he did? He prayed for the man that drove the nail in his hand. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So why is it that at 12 noon, when darkness fell across the land, why did Jesus cry out in agony? Because he had begun dying a spiritual death. God the Father has been, he has started pouring out on Christ the sins of the world. And when Jesus became sin, God the Father had to turn his back on his only son. And that's when Christ cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so Jesus died a spiritual death upon the cross. Isaiah 53, 9, and Matthew 27, 46. So that's category number two, spiritual death. Category number three is the second death. Only unbelievers die the second death.
right here at the moment of your physical birth, God imputes soul life to biological life. So God gives soul life to biological life, and there we have human life. Now, God also looks down, and he sees the sin nature. It's in every cell of your human body. And so, he also imputes to the point of affection, to the sin nature, Adam's original sin. This causes spiritual death. You say, I didn't want that. That's a stroke of God's genius. Because you know what he didn't impute to you? Your own personal sins. He took your personal sins and imputed those to Christ and just gave you one. Adam's original sin. Now, so you're born in a status of spiritual death. Now you live in life, your life. You grow up to the age of accountability. And let's just point right over here. Gospel hearing. We're looking at the unbeliever. He says, I hear about all this Jesus stuff, but I'm not interested. I want to have fun. I don't want any of that stuff. That's garbage. All that Jesus stuff. I want to go on and live my life. I understand what you're saying, Christ died for my sins, but I don't do it. And so he rejects Christ. Now, here's what happens. He's still in a status of spiritual death. And all of a sudden, something happens right here. And he dies physically. The Bible says at this point, the unbeliever goes to torments. This is a compartment of Sheol. And he awaits the great white throne judgment where Jesus is going to take all of his good works from all of his life here and he's going to weigh them against his work on the cross. And the Bible says it'll never balance out. Every good deed that you've ever done as an unbeliever will never outweigh what Christ did on the cross on your behalf. And then the unbeliever is going to be cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible says, this is the second death. The first death back here was a spiritual death. The second death is being cast into the lake of fire for eternal separation from God. And guess what? It's not because God rejected you. It's because you rejected the love of God right here. The Bible says that every person will have a chance to believe. So category number three is a second death. Category number four is positional death. Positional death. Retroactively, we were identified with Christ's death upon the cross. See, as a believer, this is the answer to your sin problem. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 that our old man was crucified with Christ. That the power of sin might be broken over us. And so we agree with God. We look to our old man and say, yes, I know my old man's been crucified with Christ. I reckon him dead. The Bible says we should also reckon our new man alive as Christ walked out of the grave. And then we yield to God the Holy Spirit to walk forward. And so positional death says that part of you was on the cross with Christ. And it's taught in Romans chapter 6. It's called retroactive positional truth. 
we're identified with Christ in his death on the cross. The fifth category of death that I want you to see is temporal death. When we're out of fellowship with God as believers, we're temporarily dead to Him. You're still a family member, but He can't use you. You're dead. And this is taught in Luke 15, the prodigal son. It says, you were dead to me. Romans 8, 6 and 13. The believer is temporarily dead when he is a carnal lifestyle. He has unconfessed sin in his life. Here's something unique. Number six is new. If you've taken this category before, I slipped something in on you right here. Used to, we had seven kinds of death. Now we have eight because point number six is new. The sin unto death, I added this. Because if you stay in carnality long enough as a believer, guess what can happen to you? God can say, <clears throat> family member, I see you're not going to straighten up. The severest form of discipline is yours. I'm going to take you out of life under the sin unto death. And it's a form of discipline to sin unto death. You say, well, what is that sin that I commit? Because I don't want to do that. We don't know. We don't even know how long you have to stay out of fellowship to commit this sin. If you look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, you'll find out that they were just, they, they didn't stay in carnality too long before uh, God just yanked them right on home. If you look at the story of Saul, did you know Saul? He spent 40 years in carnality before he died and sinned unto death. 40 years of misery. And so the sin unto death is not one particular sin. But the sin unto death is being called home early under discipline. And God guarantees that you will not receive dying grace under the sin unto death. This is called the low crawl over ground glass on the way home. The believer is called home early under the most miserable conditions. So I have to ask you this morning, what's your attitude towards Bible doctrine? Oh, you can be positive. Positive to the wrong thing. We have a ton of Christians right now who are into emotionalism. They want to have a experience. Guess what is yours, friend? You know what you can't do if you're an emotional Christian? You can't die well. Because you can't take emotion to death. It doesn't work. Well. You have to think, think, think. You have to hold that promise and you have to think. We have a whole band of Christians out here in emotional revolt. We have a whole band of Christians out here under the feel-goodism. Say something to make me feel good. This is the Osteen crowd. Guess what? You go out of church, you feel great about yourself. You don't have any doctrine. You can't produce any divine good. You're continually out of fellowship. You're negative towards Bible doctrine. Guess what? Zip, zip, zip under the most miserable condition, the sin unto death. And so how do we uh, know that we're not dying to sin unto death? Positive towards Bible doctrine. Every day, take in a little more. Every day, get a new category. Every day, learn a new scripture. Every day, continually growing up. What is operational death? That is the good that we do out of fellowship. It's called dead works. Hebrews 6 1. James 2 26. 
There's operational death in the Bible. And then also the last category is sexual death. This is said of Abraham in his old age, he and Sarah were sexually dead, and then God revived them so that they could have a son. So there's eight different ways that the Bible uses the term death. And we have in Colossians 1, chapter, uh, verse 18, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And this points to the fact that Jesus overcame physical death. Point number one, category number one, the first member of the church age to be resurrected. That in all things he may have the preeminence. And the word for preeminence is protuo. It means that he has first place in everything. He's the ruler of the church he has first place. He is has all authority in the church. He's in first place. He's the first to be resurrected. He's in first place. And so Jesus Christ is the preeminent king of kings for church age. In verse 19, we see the end of this section of Scripture, and it says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And it says, in him, fullness, the word for fullness is pleroma. We see here that Christ is not only fully God, which we know he is. You can show your Jehovah's Witness this verse right here. Jesus is fully God. But also, the fullness of blessing and happiness is in Christ. So I have to ask you this morning, do you have happiness in your life? Do you have any joy? Do you have fulfillment in your life? Does your life have purpose and meaning? Does your life have any goals? Do you have anything to look forward to? Are you having any prosperity? Any blessings in life? I'm going to tell you, if you are, guess why it is? Because in Christ, all fullness dwell. All the joy and all the happiness and all the prosperity flows from Him to the church. And I'm going to tell you this morning, if you've not seen anybody uh, walking around on the earth that truly has, uh, you know, purpose in their life, definition, meaning, I'm going to tell you what. Just come follow me. You come follow me around. And if there's nobody else to set an example on earth of what living under blessing is, just come follow me around. I'll show you what it is. I have the best life that anybody could live. You know what I do? I get up in the morning and I say, thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for one more. And I get up with one intent. Take in a little more doctrine. Grow a little more like Christ. Get the work that he set before me and use that work to glorify him. And just try to let others see Christ in me. And know that at the end, there's a white horse for me. So I have to ask you, are you ready to mount up with Jesus? We can begin to ride now. We don't have to wait for that day in the sky. We can ride for Jesus every day of every week. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you, Brenda Allen, for being with us online. I'm Clinton.